All right, Matt. So how did the lion feel after becoming a cannibal? Hmm. I don't know. Full of pride. <laughs> Get it? Pride of lions. And it was full. Ah. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the graveyard. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Adam. And my name's Matt. Now, pull up a tombstone or settle into your casket and get comfortable because this is Graveyard Tales. <laughs> All right, everybody, here we are again. Matt, how you doing tonight, brother? I'm doing pretty good tonight. Good. We're glad everybody came back for another episode here. Um, I always wonder if that week in between when we post and the next week, if people are going to go out and hook up with another podcast and forget about us, you know. Um, we were on a break. Yeah, right. No, no. I was still working for this. I, I've been here the whole time. You were on a break. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah, thank you guys for coming back and for um hanging with us um we also want to thank the podbelly network go to podbelly.com you can find different shows to listen to and different tricks and tips on how to record your own podcast and you uh you know you may find some shows there that you would not have found before so go check them out podbelly.com and look through their show list and all that um really great shows there on the podbelly network that we think you will like um, we also want to thank tonight's sponsors, Every Plate, Care of, and Best Fiends. And we'll talk a little bit more about them here shortly. Um, we also want to say go check out patreon.com slash graveyard tales. Now, we've said this a lot here lately, but we think it's something you guys will like. We put out at least one episode per week that is strictly a Patreon episode. And we do the video and the audio for it. Um, we also, for our ten dollar members, put out the video of the recording of these episodes. That's ad free, and you get to watch Matt and I do it, and you get to watch some mistakes that I don't edit out, and uh, it's it's just fun. It's a little kind of behind the scenes stuff, and we usually give you a little bit of stuff that we talk about before we hit record on the audio. We record some of the video, so you get Matt and I talking just some BS beforehand that you can check out too. Um, we've had some pretty cool episodes too here lately that um, that you probably like on video there as well. We've made some new friends of Graveyard Tales here, and they have a really awesome show called The Underworld Podcast. So we thought you guys need to check them out, and we have a little promo clip of theirs for you to listen to. Do you want to know what it's like to hang out with MS-13 in El Salvador? How the Russian Mafia fought battles all over Brooklyn in the 1990s? Or what about that time I got lost in the Burmese jungle hunting the world's biggest meth lab? Or why the Japanese Yakuza have all those crazy dragon tattoos? I'm Sean Williams. And I'm Danny Gold. And we're the host of the Underworld Podcast. We're journalists that have traveled all over, reporting on dangerous people and places. And every week, we'll be bringing you a new story about organized crime from all over the world. We know this stuff because we've been there. We've seen it. And we've got the near misses and embarrassing tales to go with it. We'll mix in reporting with our own experiences in the field. And we'll throw in some bad jokes while we're at it. The Underworld Podcast explores the criminal underworlds that affect all of our lives, whether we know it or not. Available wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Adam, let's take a minute and talk about one of tonight's sponsors, Every Plate. Now, Every Plate is a meal delivery service now owned by HelloFresh where you can experience full plates and even fuller wallets as America's best value meal kit. Now, every plate makes home cooking easy and affordable and as much cheaper alternative to take out, but just as delicious. I, I think about it this way. One meal from every plate 
is about the same price as one cup of coffee. That's unbelievable. That's great, yeah. And so getting dinner on the table used to be a challenge. But now you can let every plate plan, shop, and deliver everything you need to cook a delicious meal at a delightful price. That's right. And every plate provides easy to follow recipe cards and pre portioned ingredients so you can spend less time prepping and cooking and more time enjoying good food with family or loved ones. And that's the thing, Matt. We we love getting our every plate meals because it's something that we can get Michael to help with and teach him as a 10 year old, teach him how to cook and, and here's what you put in, in the meal. Here's how you do it. And he likes doing it. And he loves the meals too. It, you know, you get kids and they're very fickle with the food they like and you can present them with food and they're like, I don't want that. I want spaghetti. But he doesn't do that with the every plate meals. He loves all of the ones that we've gotten. He loves helping us cook. And one of my favorite things about it is I don't have to go grocery shopping. No kidding. That That's the best. And, you know, my kids love it too. But I'll tell you, my two that are in college are looking at signing up for every plate when they go back to school in the fall because they get to make much better food than they typically would with stuff that they picked up for the at the grocery store and it's cheaper for them right so they'll be they'll, they'll be the hit of the campus if they do that absolutely absolutely they're gonna have people coming over saying look y'all got way better meals than we do i, I got pop tarts and peanut butter can i come eat your every plate meal <laughs> that's right so stuff i lived on in college yeah no joke so the, if you are a Graveyard Tales listener, then you can try every plate for just a dollar ninety nine per meal. All you got to do is go to everyplate.com and enter our code Graveyard199. That's G R A V E Y A R D and the numbers 199. That's right. You can get started with every plate for just a dollar ninety nine per meal. By going to everyplate.com and entering our promo code GRAVEYARD199. That's G R A V E Y A R D 199. That is up to a $100 value. That's fantastic. Well, Matt, that. That's all I've got. Uh, don't have much housekeeping this week. So why don't you tell us what are we talking about tonight, brother? Okay, so tonight we're we're going to talk about a place that's pretty pretty creepy. Uh, you know, uh, with a, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that has happened in as far as the places we talk about normally a relatively short amount of time right um i mean just a, a lot of newsworthy things that have happened at this place it's insane and that yeah it is insane so tonight we're gonna look at the cecil hotel in los angeles california and that may not ring a bell with you right away but as we get into this, it will. Um, It'll ring all sorts of bells for you. But because honestly, it didn't ring a bell for me when when we first put it on the list, and it's been on the list a long time. Yeah. Um. But I, I it didn't, it didn't resonate with me. But once I started reading, I immediately knew, you know, the place we were talking about, and you will too. And so, like we said, uh, just a lot of really wild, strange occurrences that have happened there that are kind of out outside the paranormal, but would make you believe that there might be something paranormal going on that's causing all this kind right. of stuff. But let's, you know, let's talk about it a little bit more. So, so Adam, we'll go in with the the history of the Cecil Hotel. 
All right. Um, so as we always say, go check out our sources. They're down in the bottom of the show notes in the sources section. You can find where we found all this and you can continue the research because as always, we're probably not going to cover everything about this hotel because there is so much. But you can go down and find our sources and you can keep going on the research of this if if it's something that interests you. And, you know, we like to make sure that we source everything so that credit goes um, to where credit is due because, you know, there there's people out there researching all this stuff. And then Matt and I are able to piggyback off of their research. So if we do that, that that's where we want to give the credit. So go check out our sources down in the bottom of the show notes. And before I get into this, Matt, you were saying leads you to believe something is causing this. That's one thing I want to talk about at the end is I feel like there might be something there that we haven't discovered yet. And um, after you're part of this, we can talk about that. But we need to run down a little bit of history. And then there's a lot of crazy, sad, horrific things that have happened over the years. So we're going to touch on some of that, too. Um, We won't spend much time on the events in this section due to there being so many. But in Matt's section, we'll focus on a few events in more detail, um, a few bigger events in more detail. Now, there are conflicting stories as to when the hotel officially opened, um, but we're going to go with this one because I've seen it in so many more places and it seems to fit the timeline better. So the Cecil was opened on December 20th, 1924 by three hoteliers, William Banks Hanner, Charles L. Dix, and Robert A. Shops. Second guy had a horrible name, and I apologize for that, for his family (laughs) having that name. Um, As a destination for business travelers and tourists, it was designed by Lloyd Lester Smith in the bow art style and was constructed by W.W. Padden. The hotel cost them $1.5 million to complete and boasted an opulent marble lobby with stained glass windows, potted palms in the lobby, Um, an alabaster statuary there for everybody to see. And the three hoteliers invested about 2.5 million total in this enterprise with the knowledge that several similar hotels had been established elsewhere downtown. But within five years of its opening, the United States, United States sank into the great depression. So yeah, that's got to imagine, imagine a hotel Opening in the twenties that cost one and a half million dollars to build. Right. I mean, that's a lot of money now. Right. It was it, it was unreachable then. Yeah. Yep. I, I mean, you know that you you didn't need, as an average person you didn't even aspire to making that. No. Much. I you mean, didn't. Those, those guys were uber wealthy to put together this much money to construct this hotel. Right. You didn't even fathom 1.5 million in the early twenties. That was not, that would be like us sitting there thinking we could make trillions of dollars. It's like, (laughs) I'm not Jeff Bezos. I'm not going to make that much money. You know what I mean? It's just, Mm -hmm. it doesn't ever, you aspire to certain things and I'm not aspiring to make, trillions of dollars just like i bet nobody was aspiring to make 1.5 million then but then you sink one and a half million into it and then go into the great depression right well then you're thinking you're screwed um but we'll keep going it stood at 15 stories high it had 700 guest rooms um and like we said cost one and a half million to build and the hotel wasn't open long before the first death was reported. Now, this first death was reported in 1927. The death was that of 52-year-old Percy Orman Cook, who died by suicide by shooting himself inside the hotel room uh, on January 22nd, 1927. Uh, And they said it was after not being able to reconcile with his wife and child. So he was depressed, having trouble in his family life, And he killed himself in the hotel room in 1927. So that's, what, three years after the hotel opened? Mm -hmm. Not long at all. Um, Now, during the 30s, the hotel saw a few more suicides, 
inside its walls. Four people took their lives in there during the 30s, and a woman by the name of Grace E. Margo fell from the ninth floor window and died. Now, no one's ever really determined if it was suicide or a murder. So, very mysterious circumstances under Margot's death there. Yeah. And I mean, back then, forensics weren't what they are now. They didn't have cameras. So, they just, uh, a woman fell from the ninth floor. And unless somebody saw it, they they just said fell. They couldn't say yeah. murdered. Now, the Cecil ended up, you know, it made it through the Great Depression. And it was still a... a you know, nice hotel, and it peaked in popularity in the 1940s. It still had its fancy furnishings and the high-end feel, but the city of Los Angeles at that time started pushing its homeless population to a nearby area known as Skid Row, which Skid Row is real close to there, and the Cecil started to decline in the following decades after that. They said as many as 10,000 homeless people lived within four miles or six kilometer radius of the Cecil Hotel in that time in the 1940s, which, whew, yeah. you, I mean, that's wild. Now, the grand appeal of the hotel went away at that point, and, and it started to take a turn, and, and it was quickly becoming a popular spot for housing amongst transient people. So it went from a very opulent hotel to a hotel that ended up catering to homeless people, really. You know, you could well, you could yeah. get a room for a night and and it'd be cheaper. So it it drove the cost of the rooms down, which allowed more people to be able to stay there. Right. But it wasn't necessarily that vacationers were coming to stay there you know the the locals were now able to stay there and so it it kind of invited that that local element to say hey you know i've got a few bucks i can find a room for a night maybe you know get a hot shower and a meal and it, it just it, it just started to become that right you know around this time right and, you know, it, it, like you said, the the fact that they pushed the homeless people outside of the this hotel made the really wealthy people not want to come there. Right. Which then, in turn, forced the drop in hotel prices, which then kind of made it them not be able to keep up the hotel like they once had, because if you drop the intake of money, you're not going to be able to put it into the opulent rooms and decorations and stuff like that. So here we get into some stuff that is going to be a little graphic and, and may not sit well with some people. So just understand that this is not the nicest stuff that's happening here. Um, and that this warning probably goes for the rest of the episode because of the violence that has happened at this hotel. So just just keep that in mind. Kind of a warning for you guys. Well, in 1944, a 19-year-old woman named Dorothy Jean Purcell was staying at the hotel, and she gave birth to a baby boy on the bathroom floor. She then threw the baby out the window, killing him. Just horrible. I mean, you know, that it's a crazy story. But in some of the research, it said that Purcell didn't even realize she was pregnant. She was 38 weeks pregnant, didn't know. And yeah, it, 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 you know, it just went into the bathroom to not wake up her boyfriend. Yeah. Yep. And, and speaking, of, speaking of that, her boyfriend, she claimed that she thought the baby was stillborn. So she threw him out the window rather than telling her boyfriend at the time, who, she, like Matt said, she didn't want to wake up. But the coroner actually found the baby had, in fact, been alive when he was thrown out the window. Purcell was charged with murder, but found not guilty by reason of insanity. Yeah, I mean, you know, seriously. How you cannot be in your right mind if you do something that horrible. 
No. No, I... I... No... No human being should hurt a kid like that, whether it be your kid or any kid. But... Right. Ashley and I have had that conversation when we're watching some of these true crime shows on TV. And it's like, how can you do that to your child? Right. I don't understand. So she had to have been in, in insane, clinically insane for that to even cross her mind to do. And like you said, she didn't know she was pregnant. Well, yeah, it, that there had to be something wrong there, too. Yeah. And, you know, that you, you hear those kind of stories and, and you're, you always think, how do you not realize? But it, it, it would tell me that if she didn't know, really, um, and was trying to hide it from this boyfriend when she realized that's what was happening, she's probably not taking care of herself. Right. And may, maybe leading a lifestyle that would, um, would harm, you know, the, harm the, the developing baby. And... Not that that's, I'm not, I'm not saying that that was made it okay, but that, that may have led to her mental status. That sure. the fact that she was, you know, not healthy, possibly not taking care of herself, certainly not doing anything for her unborn child that she claims to not know anything, claim not to know anything about. Right. You know, so it just, you know, it just kind of leads you to think, yeah, she probably was. You know, it, at least she was at the time. Right. But that also gives you kind of an idea of the people that were inhabiting this hotel at the time. Right. Kind of a, a, a peek into the inner workings of who was staying there. Now, this also, this article also said that Elizabeth Short, which you may know that name because she's also known as the Black Dahlia was rumored to have been drinking at the Cecil Bar shortly before her gruesome murder. Now, it says this fact remains unverified. Um, and obviously, her murder is still unsolved because there's been investigation into it, but nobody's um, solved it yet. But I, with the reputation this hotel has, I wouldn't put it past... It, the Black Dahlia Elizabeth Short drinking there not long before she was murdered. Yeah. Because there seems to be weird synchronicities that happen to people with this hotel. Mm hmm. And, and perhaps even met her, her killer there. Right. Exactly. Now, there was one confirmed death that year, 1947, though. Robert Smith, um, he fell from the building. So, again, fell, pushed, maybe jumped. jumped, something. Now, two other falls and one confirmed suicide happened between 1954 and 1962. So, we got a lot of quote-unquote falls from this building. Yeah, and uh, one, one fall in particular... Uh, was was most uh, tragic but interesting. Uh, George Gianni, his death was really some bad luck. So it all started when 29-year-old Pauline Otten and her estranged husband checked in the hotel and started arguing. She became upset and wrote a suicide note and jumped out of a ninth floor window. Who now something Gianni, about the ninth floor. Yeah. Now Gianni at that time was walking directly below her. Oh no. She landed on top of him and it killed both of them. Oh no. So at first the police thought it was a double suicide. Sure. But once they investigated, they noticed that Gianni's hands were still inside of his pockets, which was a gesture that he was actually walking at the time of his death. Right. And they you said, hey, it would be impossible to leave your hands in your pocket if you're falling nine stories. I was going to say, you don't I, jump and keep your hands in your pocket casually like that. I know. You'd, you'd have to have some serious control. Here I go. I'm going to keep my hands yeah. in my pockets. 
You well, know, or like I, I would hate for anything to fall out. <laughs> right. Like crossed arms. You cross your arms and then Yeah. And then jump. I was like yeah. uh, reflexes would take over for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's wild. And see, it's that, that synchronicity, man, again, with the ninth floor mm-hmm. and a fall, a jump, you know, suicide. It's mm, something about this place, which I've got my theories that we'll get into here shortly. Now, this is possibly the most terrifying death to have happened at the Cecil, according to this article here. A 65-year-old telephone operator from the hotel named Pigeon Goldie Osgood had been staying at a room in the hotel for the past five years. Now, can I just say Pigeon is a very interesting name. Yeah. Yeah. I honestly don't think I've heard anybody else named Pigeon. Nope. Ain't me either. Uh, But Pigeon, uh, she had been staying there for... The past five years, but on June 4th, 1964, she was found dead in her room. She had been raped, beaten, and stabbed. The newspapers, yeah, newspapers reporting on the murder at the time said her friends claimed to have seen her just minutes before her body was found by a man delivering new telephone directories. Her murder is also still unsolved. How bizarre that they saw her just minutes before. Right. So before it, her it, body was found. Right. Not before the killer came in. Not before. So, like, if we're talking minutes, it had to have been under 60. Right? Yeah. Because if you're yeah. just talking about vocabulary, they would have said an hour before. So you're probably talking 45 minutes all the way down to five minutes. Yeah. But it, it had to have been enough time for somebody to do all that. But they get away. Yeah. So it it's really strange. It there's some really strange things about this hotel. Now, at least two serial killers are known to have stayed at the hotel during the nineteen eighties and the nineteen nineties. Both Jack Wunterweger or Unterweger, however you say it, um, and Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker, and Matt will get into Richard Ramirez here a little more in depth shortly. Uh, they're both alleged to have stayed there in the middle of their killing sprees. So that'll be interesting when we get to that. But before Matt gets into Richard Ramirez, let's look at uh, Jack real quick. Now, I'm going to just skip his last name because it, it's <laughs> I'm I butcher it every time. So it's Jack Wunterweger or Unterweger or something. U N T E R W E G E R. So I'm just going to call him Jack. Now, Jack, uh, this says abused and abandoned as a child, went on to murder an 18 year old sex worker. While in prison, he became a writer and he was championed by some Austrian intellectuals. He was released only to kill nine more sex workers in Europe and Los Angeles, and he was convicted of the murders and found dead June 29th, 1994, after having committed suicide. So let's look at that a little more in depth. Now, in 1976, Jack was convicted of the murder of Margaret Schaefer and sentenced to life in prison. While in prison, he learned to read and write, eventually earning literary respect both inside and outside the prison. In 1984, his prison autobiography, uh, Purgatory or the Trip to Jail, Report of a Guilty Man, uh, became a bestseller. Now, it is it is written in Austrian, the title, but I can't pronounce it, so you get the English <laughs> translation of that title. Um, convinced that he was a reformed man, the state released him on parole in 1990. After his release, Jack became a literary celebrity, appearing on talk shows and booking speaking engagements. His book was made into a feature film, and the former murderer became a journalist. Not everyone, though, was convinced of his transformation. After a string of prostitute murders matched the details of the Schaefer crime, police put Jack under surveillance. After several months of detective work, 
they had gathered enough evidence to arrest him. This article says that in 1992, Jack was detained, but even then he continued to give interviews freely proclaiming his innocence and calling upon his colleagues for support. Despite his chatty demeanor, the evidence against him was overwhelming, and he was found guilty of nine counts of murder in 1994. Soon after sentencing, Jack used the string from his prison jumpsuit to hang himself. Yeah, and uh, interestingly enough, with his suicide, he used the same type of knot that uh, he used on all of his victims. Yeah. Which maybe that was the only knot he knew how to make. I don't know. Very well could have been, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it... very odd that this guy would reach celebrity status. Yeah. And yet still be operating as a serial killer. Right. It was his, it was his guys. It it was what he, um, how he hid out in the world. So to finish my notes here, this says that the Cecil got new owners in 2007 and they tried to refurbish parts of the hotel. Now, in 2011, they rebranded part of the hotel as Stay on Main. But this says, as we all know from the documentary, the hotel was in need of much bigger facelift than just the lobby upgrades and a name change. So yeah, they still left the old sign out on the yeah. side of the building, um, says the seasonal hotel. And... um. It's funny because the the hotel and used to say monthly, weekly, daily rates, but the monthly fell off. You can still kind of see it some on there, but that's how you know it's the old sign and that they haven't refurbished it because it's, you know, this smudge of letters that are kind of gone and it says weekly, daily rates. Yeah. Very interesting. But I teased to Matt having some more in-depth stuff so matt let's keep this weirdness going dude yeah so richard ramirez the also known as the night stalker uh he terrorized coastal california from april 80 1984 till august of 1985 now in in less than a year and a half he was suspected of murdering 38 people ages Mm -hmm. 9 to 83. And it covered an area all the way from Orange County to San Francisco. Now, it said that when he was operating in Los Angeles, his base of operations was uh, the Cecil Hotel. Go figure. And and a lot of people speculate that the reason that, uh, that Jack chose the Cecil Hotel was because of Ramirez having worked out of there. Probably so. You see that a lot in the um, serial killer game. Yeah. um, Where they try to either one up each other or they respect another one. So they try to do what they did or or something like that. Well, you know, you at at this point by the by the 80s. A hotel like this didn't get a whole lot of attention from anyone. Right, right including the police. So there, there weren't people just milling around that were trying to make sure that everybody that came in and out of that hotel was on the up and up. That's true. So you could pretty much go there and stay unnoticed. Mm-hmm. I mean, no, nobody was asking questions. You know, it, it wasn't a situation where people were hanging out and getting friendly you know, they weren't just chatting each other up in the bar. Oh, you're in room so and so. Well, it's nice to meet you. I'm, it, it, that wasn't the case. As okay? long as you could pay, they didn't care. They didn't care. Okay, and you could get you could get there and stay as long as you wanted, as long as you were paying the bill. Right. So it was an ideal place for Ramirez to work out of. Now they even say that he disposed of evidence including bloody clothes in the hotel's dumpster. And that's, that's speculatory, but it's, it's a, it's a reasonable deduction 
um, based on interviews with Ramirez. I was going to say it's probably highly likely. All right, so let's take a second and talk about one of our longtime sponsors, Care Of. You've heard us talk about them before, but it's still a company that we love. Now, all of Care Of's products are formulated with good for you clean ingredients that are backed by science. And Care Of is super transparent about the research and sourcing behind each one of their products. So you can order the vitamins that you want and get them delivered straight to your door in a package with your name on it and your recommendations come in daily individual wrap packets that are perfect for getting back into or even starting up a routine care of makes it easy with the personalized subscription delivered to your door like i said each month contact free so you never have to worry about running out and that's fantastic because you don't have to go to the store and try to figure out what vitamins you need and do i need fish oil do i need vitamin d or c you just take a quiz with your goals in mind and they'll tell you here's the best things for you to get if you don't want something in there you can say no i'll skip that you know i've already got that at home i'll skip that or hey let me add more i want to add some probiotics or something to it you can do that too and then you get it right there every month with a packet you can drop in your pocket and take to work or take to the gym or whatever. It, it I, I love it. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's super convenient. And you know you're getting quality supplements. And just recently I started looking at, you know, some heart-healthy supplements. Sure. And Care Of helped me figure out which supplements I needed to, to help with cholesterol and blood pressure and just general heart health and instead of having to sit there with half a dozen bottles and blink 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 Mm -hmm. blink blink in my little med planner so i don't forget them they're right there all in one package i can just pull the next day's package rip it open and all my supplements are there and i know what i'm taking because i have a nice little information sheet for each one that tells me exactly what it is and it's great. I mean, it makes things so simple, and it's much easier than standing at the at the vitamin store or at the at the nutrition aisle, going, "Which one of these do I take? The, how much? What is that? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, why is why is this is this one better? It's ten dollars more. You don't have to worry about that. Right. With care of. And I tell you, your significant other will like it too, because before care of, you should have seen my bathroom countertop. Ashley hated it. It covered in 15 bottles of stuff. And, you know, I I just had a pile of everything there. And she would say, okay, keep that on your side. Quit encroaching on my side with all your bottles. So I just now have a little box that I keep right there. And every morning I go grab my packet and happy wife, great vitamin taken. So I, I love care of. Graveyard Tales listeners can get 50% off their first care of order. And all you got to do is go to takecareof.com and enter our promo code GRAVE50. That's G R A V E 5 0. That's right. For 50% off your first care of order, all you got to do is go to takecareof.com and enter our promo code at checkout, which is GRAVE50. G R A V E. Five zero. So I mean, it, it, it we we talked about synchronicities. It was odd. There's a, a docu series on the Night Stalker that I just up and started watching about a week, two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. You know, not even thinking, you know, about this, and then. <laughs> I'm like, oh, hey, here he is again. So, uh, I mean, so a, a really, a really crazy. Now, it's interesting to say Ramirez was only convicted of 13 murders. But they, they suspected him in 38, at least. Right. Now, probably the most bizarre death that has been reported from the Cecil Hotel 
is that of Elisa Lamb. Yeah. Now, now that name may not ring a bell immediately, but when we go into this story, I bet most people will remember it. I know I certainly did when it happened. Yeah. It, it was it was creepy, Matt. That's yeah. why I remember it is because of how creepy it was. Yeah. Now, 21-year-old Canadian tourist Elisa Lamb was murdered, but her death, like I said, it's one of the most haunting in the history of the hotel. In February of 2013, an employee discovered her body floating naked in the water tanks on the hotel's roof. Now, Elisa, like I said, was a 21-year-old Canadian student who disappeared in 2013 at the Cecil Hotel while she was traveling across the United States. A video of Elisa filmed in the hotel elevator before she vanished went viral when it was released by L.A. police during their investigation. Now, the night that Elisa Lamb disappeared, a security camera in the elevator captured four minutes of extremely disturbing footage. She ducks into the elevator, crouches low as if she's trying to hide, presses herself up against the wall, and occasionally looks out into the hallway as if looking for somebody that might have been chasing her. The elevator doors didn't close. And she appeared to be speaking with someone that you can't see. Now, her, her actions were really strange. She would jump in and out of the elevator. Um, you know, just she's, she's frantically pushing buttons. So it makes you think, is there somebody that's off camera that she's reacting to? Or, or was she experiencing a mental health crisis? Mm-hmm. But then just as soon, you know, just like it started, she's out and she's gone and, and nobody, nobody has seen her. Nobody had seen her since she got off the elevator. So the police issued an appeal for help, uh, from the public. And that's when they put out the security video, noting that Elisa was wearing a red hoodie. Now, the video sparked widespread interest and, and speculation in the case, and one theory arose that Lamb was playing what is sometimes called the Korean elevator game, in which pressing elevator buttons in a specific pattern will supposedly open a portal to another dimension. Right. So while she is still missing, guests at the hotel began to complain about low water pressure, the water tasting funny. One, one guest even said that the water was black. So on February 19th, 2013, a maintenance worker looked down into one of the, the four by eight foot water tanks on the roof of the hotel and spotted a dead body that turned out to be a Lisa Lamb. The worker said in court documents, quote, I noticed the hatch to the main water tank was open and looked inside and saw an Asian woman lying face up in the water approximately 12 inches from the top of the tank. The roof had been searched previously with the assistance of a police dog, but no one had checked in the water tanks. I, I don't doubt that no one checked the water tanks, because why would you think that anybody would have managed to climb into the water tank? Right, and I think from... What I had seen too, there was a fence around the water tank, so it, it it was like to get in there, they had to climb the fence and then climb the water tower uh, yeah. to get on top of it. Yeah. And I, I'm sorry, I had to say this that the water thing, water tasting funny and being black, that is so gross. Oh yeah, that that's decomposition in the water. Can you just think? Mm. You, 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 you're you sitting there pouring the water. You're taking a shower. You're getting a <sighs> drink, making your morning coffee. You're like, oh, my God, this water tastes terrible. Yeah. And, and then, then you learn. Yeah. And then you find out it's because <laughs> there was a decomposing lady in the thing. And how much of that water had you drank? And, oh, my God, it gives me the heebie-jeebies thinking about it. Yeah. But going back to you mentioning 
access to the water tower or the water tank. Mm -hmm. Now, during the investigation, uh, after the discovery of her body, it was, uh, it was reported that entry to the roof was supposed to be restricted to hotel employees, meaning that lamb would have needed a key for access. Right. Yeah. And, and the locked door was also equipped with an alarm, which was said to have been functioning correctly that should have alerted staff that it had been opened. But there were also three fire escapes that provided access to the roof. Now, the, the autopsy and toxicology tests led the coroner to issue a ruling that Lamb, Lamb's death was by accidental drowning. There were no indications of physical trauma on her body. There were no drugs in her system that would have contributed to her death. The coroner's report mentioned that Lamb's bipolar disorder as, uh, as a significant condition that must have played a role in her death, but they, they were looking for the medication that she was taking for it to see if it was in her system, and it was. Now, this case... It, it it's so so weird, um, but a reconstruction of how she died makes it even more weird. Like I said, for Lamb to have entered the water tank by herself, she would have not only had to get onto the roof undetected, which we've already determined would have was a difficult enough task. Mm -hmm. She would have had to climb she would have had to have climbed into the tank or up to the platform and then climbed a 10-foot ladder on the side of the tank she then would have had to have opened a heavy water tank lid before getting inside all this by herself with nobody noticing yeah and then at some point she would have had to have gotten undressed because her clothes were in the tank with her naked body. And, the, you know, they never found her cell phone, which was another, you know, another issue. It was like she had one. They were never able to locate it. It wasn't in the tank with her. So yeah. she, she so must have, that go? she must have either gotten rid of it or something. Maybe, I, who knows? But you, you would begin to start to think, well, whoever killed her, Took her phone. Exactly. Yep. You know, but why strip her naked unless she yeah. was already naked when you're dragging her body up there? But then you brought her clothes with her and put yep. them in the tank, too. And so then it said the coroner said it was accidental drowning. So did you drown her and then throw her in there or did you get her in there and drown her in there? Yeah. Or I mean, it. There's parts of it that look like suicide. There's parts of it that look like murder. It's so weird. But it it none of it none of it fits very yeah. well because if you if you start thinking that this was a murder, that means that somebody had to drag her body up a ten foot ladder. True. And then again, move a heavy water tower uh, mm -hmm. tank lid um, to get her into the tank. Right. So, okay, you're like, well, maybe it was multiple people. Maybe so. There's still one ladder. How many ladders do you know that multiple people can climb and, and help somebody carry something? Yep. And if they were going to have to drag her up the fire escape, that wouldn't have been no easy task either. And there's no, there, there's no eyewitnesses, no security footage that shows anyone else with her or dragging her body through the hotel to access it through the interior stairwell mm -hmm. and then they would have needed to have the key or they would have set the alarm off right i don't know it it, it is really really weird um and it's led a lot of people to to speculate that there was some paranormal involvement in this that you know she she wasn't murdered um but she also didn't have a, a mental health crisis and commit suicide in this manner that 
something helped her along. Yep. Yep. Because there, something helped her gain access to places that she shouldn't have been able to gain access to. Right. Exactly. Now, let's talk about the hauntings, which is, you know, what we're always here for. And interestingly enough, the Cecil Hotel does not have a big laundry list of spirits or activity or things like that. But there's there's a good reason why is when the hotel, you know, closed up. Nobody was going in and out of there. They were not giving tours. You know, this was not a a hot spot of, hey, let's take a tour of the old Cecil Hotel. No, it wasn't. Right. And, and they weren't doing it. And they even hired extra security staff to keep people out. So there's not a lot of activity inside the hotel for people to have witnessed paranormal activity. Sure, but, yeah. As we always say, with this much death going on, you would think, there's bound to be some ghosts rattling around in there somewhere. Got to be something. Now, there's one specific ghost sighting that the media covered in 2014. A, a young boy was out with one of his friends, and he passed by the Cecil Hotel, and he claimed to be creeped out when he looked up at the hotel and took a picture of the front of the building. On Upon looking at the picture they saw that there was an apparition in the picture. Now, the picture shows an almost transparent human figure standing on the ledge of one of the windows on the hotel's fourth floor. The shape of the apparition looks as if it's about to jump off the window ledge. Now, a lot of newspapers and other media released the picture, and the boy claimed that he felt creeped out when he took it, and once he saw it, he had a lot of trouble sleeping after that. I can only imagine. Right. Now, you can you can look at this photo. It it is kind of weird. It definitely looks like it, it could have been mocked up, but I it doesn't it seems like a legitimate picture. I mean, you know, I'm sure that before it ever ran in a newspaper that there were a lot of people checking and double checking and making sure that this was an authentic photograph. A YouTuber, Pete Montzingo, lives across the street from the Cecil Hotel and earlier this year posted a video about the things that he has seen from his window. Pete reports that he has seen shadows, fans turning on, lights being on one day and then off the next, and curtains in different positions from day to day. One day... He claims that he saw an old man in one of the windows smoking a cigarette. Now remember, there's nobody there. It's closed down. They're not letting people in. And he sees a guy sitting in the window smoking a cigarette. But he said it appeared that the man was staring right at him. Now, thinking it was just his, imag his imagination, Pete walked into another room. And when he looked, the man's gaze had followed him. Oh, wow. So, obviously freaked out, Pete says he hid behind his sofa, and when he finally decided to look again, the man was gone. Now, he even says that he saw a shadow of what, of what appeared to be someone hanging in run, one of the rooms. Now, he says he contemplated calling the police, but realized the Cecil Hotel had been locked up for years. No one was there, and calling the police would likely end up with him being viewed as a prankster or just imagining things or on drugs. Mm -hmm. So he, he didn't do anything later. The shadow was gone, but it doesn't stop here. Pete says the strange events are not limited to the hotel itself. He says one day the fire alarm went off inside the hotel, which he has video of. You can see the flashing strobes uh, from outside. But no one was supposed to be in the hotel. As this was happening, he was talking to a friend about his fear that the spirits knew that he was talking about them. Suddenly, the fire alarm in his apartment, but only in his apartment, went off. Oh, wow. And, and Pete even says that there was a water bottle that was sitting on his television and it flew off and crashed against the wall. 
Well, I guess they knew he was talking about him. Yeah. So, as I said earlier, they weren't really keen on anybody getting in to the Cecil Hotel. So, there, there hadn't been, up until recently, any type of paranormal investigation. So, for years, paranormal investigators from all over begged and pleaded to get access to the Cecil, but they were always refused. And, and like I said earlier, extra security stra- staff was added just to keep professional and amateur ghost hunters and dark tourists from trying to sneak in. You know, that's another thing. You know, people, you know, you got two serial killers that operated outside of that hotel. There's people that they want to be there. They want to go and see that room. You know, this is, you know, this, it's a, it's a thing. Okay. People do that. It's strange to me, but it, it, it does happen. Yep. But finally, the crew from Ghost Adventures was granted the opportunity to investigate. And the episode air in, aired in January of this year. So this is, I mean, this is all stuff that's happened recently. Yeah. Now, our old buddy Zach Bagans, when he was interviewed about the time that he spent in the Cecil Hotel, he called the hotel, quote, spectacularly frightening. Now, he said he has a special connection with the Cecil because he has collected some of the Night Stalker's drawings, clothing, and even his television from his death row cell. Of course he has. So, you know, I said this is a thing. Yeah, Zach Zach has that thing. Yep. Now, he just bought um, James Dean's transaxle because apparently that transaxle is supposed to be haunted that whole car or something is supposed yeah. to be haunted and he just he paid millions for that transaxle yeah nuts <laughs> i would never drive it you know yeah well this you can't because they, they've chopped it um so it's not the whole car now bagans believes that dark energies control the hotel and in an interview, he said, quote, I've been to a lot of places throughout the world, but when you walk through the doors of the Cecil Hotel, you know there are other doorways to other worlds. If we, if we were to see deeper dimensionally, we would see all those other doors and rooms. I believe it goes way down into the earth and draws a lot of energy through the earth. It's then magnified by the dark energy and criminal activity of Skid Row and amplified by the rituals of Jack Wunterweiger and Richard Ramirez. So maybe he's got a point. Yeah, I mean, this might as well, I might as well take this as the chance to throw in what I was thinking because that's very similar to what I was thinking, that there's something about either that hotel or the land that the hotel is on. That is, I hate the word vortex, but I don't know another way of putting it. Um, But I hate vortex because it's been. eh, It's eh. it's overused. It's yes. Yep. By by too many people about too many things and energy vortexes and stuff has become a hippy dippy thing. But um, is there some kind of vortex? Is there a crossing of some type of power lines in that area that creates, like we've talked about uh, energy spots that hold negative energy. And could that negative energy be feeding either demonic energy, but I don't like to think everything is demonic. You know, Uh I, uh I understand that there is demonic energies and demonic entities that do exist, but I, I think that's uh, things are, are said to be demonic when they're not. Uh, but could it just be that there's such a negative energy impact on that area that it messes with the minds of people and it causes them to jump from floors to kill people to um, do things like the Elisa Lamb? Thing that you know, 
if it was if if she was not murdered, if it was just her something that messed with her brain and facilitated uh, her suicide in doing this, like so many others. And then you have people there like Jack and Richard that not only did they feed into it, but they fed off of it. And it intensified their negativity and also intensified the negativity of the place. Uh Like, I, I really believe there's something about not the hotel, but that place. Yeah. Because it's not just the hotel. You've got Skid Row and all the violence in Skid Row and stuff that's real close to that area. So there's something that's got to be happening around that hotel that's causing all this and feeding off of it. Yeah. I I think it, it it's it's a puzzle because it's a it's a chicken and an egg type deal. Sure. You know, yep. which which came first? You know, was the energy already there and did it somehow influence all of the the negative events that occurred there or did the negative events just act as a magnet to bring more negative energy and and then it became a cycle you know there's negative energy here something horrific happens and that builds the negative energy and now something even worse happens and like it, a battery charging and discharging yeah so it's really difficult to even theorize what came first. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's just it's it's one of those things where we 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 see we see where desperation can can fuel that energy. I mean, we talk about it when we we're talking about a haunted prison. Even the haunted hospital. I mean, you you think about the despair that happens inside a hospital. Yep. And and severe poverty, it it brings about desperation. And all that emotion, especially with the number of suicides that have occurred there, you just you you just look at it and say there's there's something that's just not good here and right right you know the fact that they are they have been doing renovations on on the cecil hotel it makes me wonder why yeah why why just tear it down just at this point just tear it down i mean you you renovate it you you build it back up to some type of glory who's going to come there but the, the people that want to investigate it and the people that want to see those rooms where Elisa Lamb stayed, where Richard Ramirez stayed, that, that's what you're going to draw. So just scrap it and start over. Well, and if you do that and you start bringing more people in, are you going to feed whatever negative battery is there? And then we're just going to start the cycle all over again with new people where more death may be intensified, you know? Right. So you've tripled the amount or quadrupled the amount because you've rebuilt it. Now you've got more people and you're adding to that energy and it's, you know, is this a place that we need to just say, no, nothing's happening here. This is a bad place. Yeah. I mean, you're really not talking about a, a, a great, historic landmark right i mean we're not talking about a century year old castle we're not talking about a a hotel where former presidents stayed and you're you're just you're not talking about a place that to me has any significant historical value other than the stories that we're sharing tonight which are horrible To, to not just go this this place isn't worth saving and I mean yeah, that, that just, may sound that may sound weird coming from me because I'm all about preserving history but this seems like history that we don't need to preserve 
Right. I, I agree. Um, it's, it's not a, it was just a fancy hotel that then became really not fancy. Yeah. And even during the fancy hotel times, there was negative things happening. There were suicides. There were, there were deaths of all sorts that were happening there, even during the time that it was this opulent hotel. So it's not just the fact that Skid Row happened and and caused it to be that way. You know, it, it was it, it had that energy before then too. I think that may be proof, though, that it was bringing and drawing negativity to it. Mm -hmm. Whatever was there was feeding and and drawing in more of the negative, more of the bad to it. Yeah. Now, to kind of wrap up the investigation, uh, Zach plays the elevator game in the elevator that Elisa Lamb was last seen. Well, that's stupid. Now, yeah. So this caused some unexplained technical malfunctions. They reported cold breezes, which, you know, Bagans believes might have been a spirit joining him on the elevator. Now, the investigation lasted two nights, and the crew captured an EVP of Elisa's full name in the room where she stayed. They did collect some photos of apparitions and got a response on a device they call the paranormal puck. Mm -hmm. which says that Elisa Lamb was killed by a being, quote, being. And that being is still linked to the Cecil Hotel. Now, Michael Perry was a medium who was brought in to investigate by the Ghost Adventures team, and he says he believes someone led Elisa to the roof because they knew to hide her there and that her attacker was, quote, not in a physical body. Again, that hmm. you know, we talked about all the all all the difficulty that Elisa Lamb would have had or her murderer would have had in getting her body into that water tank. Well, now we're talking about the potential that it was a spirit that led her there or some right. type of entity. Now, Bagans also said that the Cecil was messing with him and his crew's minds and electronic equipment. Now, investigator Aaron Goodwin was also overcome with feelings of rage while inside the hotel. And there was even a crime scene photographer who was so disturbed while he was inside that he had to leave. Aaron gets disoriented all the time, though. I mean, that guy. <laughs> yeah. That guy freaks out over everything. So, yeah. But it it is it is strange. And, you know, the fact that people that were not necessarily members of their team also were able to feel that energy. Uh -huh. I was, when I, when I saw that they had been somewhat renovating it since 2017, I thought it was curious that I couldn't find any stories from any kind of, uh, workman's crew that had been inside and done any kind of work inside the hotel. Right. Was, a, a lot of times when you're doing these renovations, we, we get stories where tools go missing. Somebody's working alone in an area of the hotel and they either hear something or feel like somebody's watching them or something touches them. Uh, you know, all those things. We, we, I couldn't find any stories along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that it's, there won't be some come out. Um, yep. cause Definitely with, with the, the documentary about the Cecil Hotel being out now, um, you know, we've got this, this docu-series about the Night Stalker that's out now. This episode of Ghost Adventures just came out not even six months ago. There's, there's a lot more um, attention being, a pa being paid to the Cecil. Now, some people have speculated that the reason for all of this is trying to rebuild the reputation of the Cecil Hotel. And I don't, I don't, I'm not going to play spoilers as to what the documentary says, 
Right. But let's let's put it this way. You watch the trailer for the documentary. It's not a really good uh, representation of what the documentary is. And, uh, and, and some people believe that that's why. That they're just trying to downplay all of the negative stuff that's happened since the hotel opened in 24. To try to rebuild it and, and draw people in. Personally, like I said, I don't think that's ever going to happen. As long as it's that building... That that will always be where all of these horrible things happened, where two serial killers worked out of, where potentially the Black Dahlia came in and and socialized uh-huh. and drank, you know, where we saw numerous suicides, completely unexplained deaths. It will always be that as long as it's standing. And I don't think there's anything anyone can do that's going to change that. Right. Okay, let's take a minute and talk about one of tonight's sponsors, Best Fiends. Now, we're getting into what looks like a more normal summer. Right. You know, you can you can go sit in an air-conditioned movie theater again. You can have a barbecue with your family and friends. So, this summer will be almost normal, Um, and that is super refreshing. But you know what else can be super refreshing? Uh, A little break from your routine by playing Best Fiends. That's true. And, you know, I've I've said this all along. The, The bright colors and the fun characters make it different and unique from other, you know, mobile games that you play. It's it's really enjoyable. I mean, it it's like sitting out with a ice cold glass of lemonade on your back porch and flipping out your phone and enjoying, you know, squashing some slugs. Right. And you know, I'm in the few hundreds of levels because I'm just not that good. But Ashley is in the thousands on the levels. And, so is Amanda. Uh, yep. Uh, hey, that says something about our brain power versus theirs, doesn't it? <laughs> That's right. Um, but uh, Ashley's just like, she's killer at this game. And that's a pun on killing the slugs. But um, I, I still enjoy it, even though I'm not that great, because it's it's fun. Like you said, it's not just a match three puzzle game that everybody has. There's little storylines that go through the game, and it's always changing. It changes per season they have different uploads and they're always uploading new levels so even though ashley's on you know level 50 bajillion she's not going to run out there's many more bajillions of episodes left because they keep adding them so you don't have to worry about running out so there's just so much to love about this game so give it a try and let us know if you love it as much as we do. So you can download the five-star rated puzzle game Best Fiends for free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. That's right. You can download the five-star rated puzzle game Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. You know, I, I, I sit here and I think, could we talk about the frequencies of sound that can cause, you you know, you to hallucinate and your mind to be messed with? And for some of these things, maybe I could I could see that like that area has that. But I, I think there's too much. There's too much that goes on there for it to be just some, you know, weird sound that's being, I guess, produced by something in that area that's causing people to feel uncomfortable and all that. There's, it wouldn't cause all the rest of this stuff. It wouldn't draw the negativity to it. 
So I, I stick by my thought of there's something about that land. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's that building. I think it's that land. And I think we need to look further back Yeah, into the history before the Cecil was built. What has happened there? And is there a history of, you know, back when indigenous peoples lived there, was right. there death and negativity in that area and and maybe it's just a a thing there there's places on this earth that are more unsuitable for habitation than others and some of it is not the physical some of it may be the the spiritual the energetic whatever you want to call it yeah but the Cecil Hotel, to say the least, is is a fascinating place um, when you're looking at it under the paranormal microscope. You know, even without ghost, a lot of ghost sightings, e- even without a lot of stories about things moving or the typical activity that we see when we discuss a haunted place, it it still feels like something that it is haunted. Probably by something much, much larger and maybe even much more sinister than, you know, we can Mm -hmm. even imagine. But what do you guys think? Do you guys think that there's like Adam's right, that there's something about the land and the Cecil Hotel being built there? It it attracted all these people and it affected them in, in some way. Or do you believe that all of these tragedies? have a perfectly reasonable explanation, but something about that hotel brought all these negative events. Let us know. And one of the best places to let us know is in our Facebook group. You can just search for Graveyard Tales and you'll find it. It's it's a safe place to come and share thoughts and opinions, a few jokes. Um, it's really, really active and, and it's a really great place. Um, on the internet when there's so many places that aren't that great anymore. Um, <laughs> right. But uh, also on social media, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter. And then you can cruise over to our website, which is graveyardpodcast.com. And on our website, you can listen to the show. You can find links to purchase Graveyard Tales merchandise. And you can become a patron. And we always thank everyone who has taken time to donate to the show. And our Patreon uh, material has got a pretty pretty decent sized uh, catalog now. Um, yep. So, like I said, if you've been on the fence about it, uh, give it a shot. I think you'll enjoy the content that's there. Like we mentioned at the top of the show, you get video of the episodes of of Adam and I um, uh, making the sausage, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> All the flubs and foul ups and things we edit out before we actually put the audio version uh, public. Adam, I think that's all I got for the Cecil. What a crazy place. I know. It's nuts, man. Yeah. So until next time, we'll save you a seat in the graveyard. See you soon. See you soon.